Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming today to CERC's, um, I think it's our third or fourth talk of the semester. So we have at least a couple more. One for sure uh, in early April by Professor Claudine Ang, who is Professor of Humanities and History at Yale and US uh, in Singapore. So she'll be here speaking about Ming loyalism um, after the fall of the Ming. So you'll be getting emails and uh, um, uh, flyers about that over the next few weeks. But to begin today's talk, we're very honored to have Professor Sean Turnell with us today, all the way from, I always forget this wrong, Macquarie, Macquarie, Macquarie University. Um, he's on a little bit of leave right now because he is the special economic consultant to the state counselor, who you may know as uh, Gong San Suu Kyi. And he has been a researcher of Myanmar's economy for over 20 years. And we took Burmese lessons together many, many years ago back in America. So uh, Sean and I go way back. Um, concurrently, a professor at Macquarie University in Sydney and formerly at the Reserve Bank of Australia, Sean has written widely on Myanmar's economy. In addition to the Myanmar government, he has been an advisor on Myanmar to the US State Department and other agencies to USAID, to Australia's Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, to the World Bank, and many, many other international bodies. In 2009, Sean's book on the history of the financial sector in Myanmar called Fiery Dragons, Banks, Moneylenders, and Microfinance in Burma was published. He has been a visiting fellow at the University of Cambridge, Cornell University, Johns Hopkins, and the Institute of Southeast Asian Studies in Singapore. In addition to his advisory role, Sean is the Director of Research at the Myanmar Development Institute in Napio, Myanmar. So today, Sean's uh, talk will be on stock take of Myanmar's economy and reforms. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Sean. Thank you very much, Tom. Um, and, and thank you uh, for arranging this uh, and to Marco, Renaud, uh, and Danny, every, everyone for coming as well. It's a really great pleasure to be here. Um, I was saying to Ian Holiday a little while ago, coming from Napier, and I suspect a lot of people here have been to Napier, uh, to arrive in Hong Kong compared to Napier is just one of those really shocking things as to make you feel like you're on another planet. Um, anyway, so it's a very great pleasure to be here, and thank you all for, for coming out to see me. Um, I've got some slides here that I'll go through, but um, I didn't stick to them at all. Um, uh, and, and so in my talks on Myanmar and indeed my lectures generally, uh, I tend to be very, very informal. So I'll try to do that as much as I can uh, here as well. And so if there's anything you'd like to know, um, I'm not sure what the ground rules usually are, but, but do feel free to ask, because I think that, that there's not that many of us we don't need to worry. Uh, about uh, ceremony, I didn't think. Um, in fact, the main reason the slides are there are really just so that there's some really nice pictures in case you get bored. Um, but other than that, uh, and it gives me some sort of organising thing to talk about the economy. But as I say, I'm very happy to take questions on anything at all. Nothing's off the record. Um, sorry, <laughs> nothing's off limits, I think, on the record. Um, and um, if I can't answer you, it's because I can't, not, not because I'm not willing. Uh, so. Uh, Anyway, so yeah, so but I, but I will stick to the economy for the most part. But as I say, happy to talk about anything as we go along. Um, so what I've done, I've just broken things up into various topics of the economy. Um, but you'll see that when we look at those topics, they sort of merge into each other uh, as we go along. But we'll look at growth, the fiscal story, external trade, etc., exchange rate, inflation, financial sector, miscellaneous. That's obviously where there'll be a lot of the action uh, and challenges where there's even more action uh, when it comes to, to the Um I, I should have mentioned too, right at the beginning actually, and Tom very nicely just mentioned this Myanmar Development Institute. Um, so that's a relatively new institute up there in Napier that's um, mostly funded by the Koreans, and so it's sort of semi government in that it has a, it was established by a cabinet decree, but it's not really a government institution. And the reason why I just mention that is because the in a sort of scholarly community. We're very much uh, open, the institution's very much open to all sorts of collaborations. You'd be very welcome to come and visit uh, if, if you're ever in Asia. So just occurred to me and I thought I'd, I'd mention that. Okay, um, so let's start off with the economy just by studying the basic story of growth. Now, the story I'm going to tell here is quite different from the narrative that's developed around Myanmar's economy in the press 
place that is popularly believed. I think there's a number of reasons for that. One, why the dichotomy of that is quite the difference. One of them, I think, is because of the events in Myanmar have not gone the way that any of us, I think, would have liked, uh, because of the controversies and the terrible events in Rakhine and Kachin State and various other places, I think there's now, and, and given that this kind of the expectations were so high, that we've got a situation where there's quite a jaundice lens, I think, on no matter what the topic is. Um, and, and I don't mean that that's deliberate or conspiracy or anything like that, but I think there's just a predilection for looking at Myanmar as, as a sort of country that's failing or a, or a country that's uh, you know, having all sorts of trouble. Um, so what, what I wanted to do with the economy is to actually point out just really how quite strong it is. Um, now one could argue all sorts of reasons for that, and maybe well as we go along, but, but you, you'll notice that the numbers are mostly positive, but, but again, very happy to debate those as, as we go through, and, and I'll be very open too as we go through about where the weaknesses are and so on as well, because there certainly are plenty of them. But anyway, GDP growth is about 6.2%. That's the 10th fastest growing economy in the world. So it's down a bit from the previous year, it was 6.8%. Part of that is the Rakhine story. Uh, the investment that had been expected just didn't come. The tourism sector, particularly tourism from the West, which we'll look at later, is really down. So there's a number of reasons why there's been a little bit of a job. China's slowly, much more, of course, than the official statistics would suggest to us. So that is actually having a big impact on the Um But a few other things around the edges as well. The global economy itself is a little bit less uh, stable than it was. And so some of the investment that had been there in that previous year uh, had come off of it. So anyway, so growth's down a little bit, but still very solid at 6.2%. If we can stick to that, then that would certainly be welcome. The World Bank uh, is predicting for this current financial year 6.6%, so an acceleration of growth. But again, just to illustrate and be very frank with you, I don't see that happening myself. I think the, the World Bank has been a little bit too optimistic. Um, I should say too, by the way, these numbers are World Bank numbers. So and I deliberately did that, even though there's some of the numbers well, like the growth that I suggested then, that I don't particularly agree with, but I didn't want to get hung up over debates about the data. So this is independent data, it's not Myanmar government data at all. This is from the latest Myanmar economic monitor of the World Bank. So yeah, that's where the actual numbers are coming from. Okay, so yeah, so, so they're saying 6.6%. I'm a little bit doubtful, to be honest. Um, and in fact, if we can get anything with a six in front of it, I'd be really happy, but, uh, but we'll see. Um, one of the interesting things about the growth is where it's coming from. And I've got there strong agriculture, SME. Um, that's sort of a bit of shorthand for the slide, to be honest. The most pleasing thing about the growth is that it's very, very broad-based. It's not coming from any particular area. And that's really interesting because that means that I think the Myanmar experience stands quite at odds with the experience of most of the other Asian tigers, where it's very much a story of manufacturing, locking into global supply chains, things like that. That's not really the Myanmar story so far. There's a bit of that which we'll come to, but really what it is is broad-based growth and growth filling in the gaps that have been opened up. And there's a negative aspect here, which is that it's not locked into global supply chains yet. So we're not seeing a Vietnam type story. But the upside is that it's very much private sector, as we'll look at in a moment, the state of anything has been a drag on the economy. It's very much private sector, and it's filling the freedom spaces that have been in place for about the last four or five years. So it's really interesting, given the sort of political economy hat on, it's private entrepreneurs filling spaces that up, you know, up until four or five years ago were absolutely dominated by the state. So there's something quite positive about that, about entrepreneurial energy and things like that. Um, the agriculture story, likewise, is surprisingly positive, with some really interesting growth pockets appearing all over the place. So it's quite pleasing at that level, but, um, but there's not that single engine growth international story that, as I say, is, you know, was the Vietnam story most recently, but so many other countries. So that's growth, good. Predicted to be better, I'm a bit doubtful, um, but it's, it's certainly chugging along reasonably okay. Uh, again, we want it to be faster than that for genuine transformation to take place. And that transformation, as I mentioned, is not really there yet, even though the growth is, is, is there. 
Okay, now fiscal affairs. Now the reason why I got that there is that this was always the original sin in Myanmar when it comes to the management of the economy. Most of the country's economic problems have come from an overwhelming state that's basically trying to extract more resources from the economy than the economy has been able to support. Certainly in terms of the tax system has been able to support or any of those appropriate mechanisms by which the state funds itself. So traditionally, Myanmar's story is an overwhelming state. It's mostly been security and military spending. And because the taxations cover nothing like the expenditure, what they've done is just print money. And from printing money, there's come inflation, monetary instability, exchange rate instability, and all sorts of other economic problems coming from that, as I say, original sin. Um, now, the interesting thing about this story, it's been a highly positive story. But again, I don't want to, to you know, suggest that uh, things are better than they might be. Part of it is by accident, part of it is by commission. So a little bit of omission is driving this story as well. But if we just look at the raw numbers, it's a good story. The government comes in very committed to making the fiscal story more stable than it had been before. Part of the, this is actually a personal story, I think, when it comes to your own censorship, because she has the, not an obsession, that's going too far. Um, she has a dislike of debt and a dislike of, of excessive uh, spending and things like that. So her predilection right from the word go was to try and bring down so the, the fiscal deficit. Anyway, we've seen that happen. 4.3% um, of GDP, 2016-17, down to 2.7% uh, now. So I mentioned part of it is deliberate, that all the agencies were told that they had to trim in their fiscal sales, basically, and they all did that. Part of it is a little bit by accident, just to say again, the government shouldn't get all of the credit. Part of it is because sometimes the agencies are not that efficient in spending the money that they get. And when they don't spend the money, it goes back into the into the pot uh, and uh, keeps the deficit lower than one otherwise would be. So there's a little bit of that, some execution problems when it comes to actually spending the money. But anyway, the fiscal deficit's down to 2.7%. Um, now that's had some positive impact, as we'll see in a moment, with respect to the monetary side of things. And so some of that, that instability is not there so much at the moment. The most pleasing thing for me at the moment is that this has given room for a bit of a fiscal space. Now, if anything, I think, as I mentioned earlier, the, the government in Myanmar has retrenched a bit too much. And so to the extent that it's actually a drawdown on the economy rather than a, a stimulating uh, aspect. So the good part of that is that there is now space for the government to actually spend more money. And of course, it's a country that desperately needs more money spent, whether it be physical infrastructure, whether it be health expenditure, uh, education, all sorts of other things. So there is uh, space for a fiscal stimulus. On top of some developments we'll look at in a moment to do with uh, bond market developments and so on, which likewise are all paint, uh, point in that same direction. So that's going to be one of the big stories of 2019, is that there's going to be much more of a, of a gentle fiscal stimulus coming from the government. Now, the good part of that, in turn, is that in the past, such fiscal stimuli were mostly uh, arbitrary and whimsical, according to whatever general wanted, whatever he wanted. Um, now it's coming through a couple of mechanisms which are part of the big story in Myanmar's economy at the moment. And those are the two things that I mentioned, or, or the, one of the things I mentioned at the bottom. Um, people may have heard this thing called the Myanmar Sustainable Development Plan. Uh, it was drawn up in, well, it was drawn up really towards the end of 2017, but it's very much come online during 2018. It's an attempt to bring coherence to the management of the economy. At its core is an infrastructure story divided up into the different areas of the economy, the different spending responsibilities and so on. But with it throughout is likewise an, a liberalisation program. So in many ways the MSDP is an attempt to uh, make manifest what the government always intended economic reform to be, uh, but also to give it a bit of momentum because there had been a fairly dramatic loss of momentum. It's fairly, fairly uh, uh, accurate to say, towards the end of 2017 and into 2018. Part of that, again, comes from the Rakhine story. And I think there was a, a genuine loss of momentum, a loss of direction for government for a period. There was also some, I wouldn't say instability, but there was a, 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 a bit of 
bit of a disjuncture, if you like. We saw the first finance minister, who, who didn't prove to be very good. Um, saw his ouster, new finance minister, who is, is just fantastic, hopefully as I'll mention as we go along. Uh, and some other institutional changes that really uh, turn things around a little bit. Anyway, central to all of that is this me and Master's Day development plan. It, it's available online, etc. so it's certainly a uh, point your direction that way. It is meant to deliver coherence and momentum, as I mentioned, but at the core is infrastructure. And within that infrastructure story, likewise, is something else that's emerged out of the MSDP that's called the Project Bank. For those of you who know me, and many of you will know, uh, Winston Sam Hall, the Deputy Minister of Finance, is very much behind this MSDP and likewise behind the Project Bank itself. Project Bank is just something very simple. It's just a listing of the major infrastructure projects that the country needs, and it's got a great many of them, but it's listing them in order of their socio-economic returns. So again, it's an effort to bring coherence and rationality to a process that was anything but in the past. So it's ranking them according to socio-economic returns, and then aligning them to funding of various types. So say, for instance, one project might be a, a road. Now, if that road could be, uh, tolls could be imposed on that road, or some other way in which profits could be generated, then such a project might be aligned to PPP when it comes to funding. On the other hand, a project might involve, say, nutrition, nutrition efforts for, uh, for new mothers, etc. Now, that's not commercially viable, so that might come out of, say, ODA funding or direct from the budget or whatever. So the projects are listed not only in terms of returns, but they're also lined up to fund it. The project bank has just been published and with that publication of that project bank, the partners in that story, whether they be private sector actors wanting to, to uh, invest in infrastructure or whether they be uh, foreign country or other countries with ODA projects, multilaterals, etc., will all sort of be allocated as part of this project bank. So that's very much got underway um, right now. But, it, but it's a very much a new story, uh, literally, within the last few weeks. Um, so, I mentioned in the past the original sin, too much spending, finance that spending through simple money printing. That's more or less come to an end. Uh, in the last financial year, about 19% of the deficit, that's not 19% of all spending, but 19% of the deficit was funded by money printing. Now, that compares to 50% the year before, and if we go back to two years before that, it's basically 100%. Now, what's happened in the meantime, firstly, we've reduced the fiscal deficit quite dramatically, so the need to money print is much less than it was. But also the bond market now is considerably more developed than it was before. So even if there is a gap between taxation and spending, selling bonds to private banks and even, we hope shortly, to the new insurance companies that are about to take root in the country, uh, that, that sets the, the whole fiscal program a reasonable track. Anyway, so that has brought uh, money printing almost to an end. It will return. Right at this moment, there's literally no money printing required, but it's just the, the same the season. Uh, there will actually have to be some borrowing from the central bank to squeeze more on books off for this financial year, but it'll be, again, significantly uh, reduced compared to what it was in the past, and ahead of program with respect to the government's efforts by 2021 to eliminate money spending of, of any kind. So we'll be back to full funding of budget deficits by 2021. Um, I mentioned the bond market just being part of the story of, of properly funding these deficits. The first bond tender, a competitive bond tender, took place in September uh, 2017. And as bond tenders everywhere, this is a way in which you, you do the fund the deficits. Right? So if you sell the bonds, you call for the tenders. A competitive interest rate then sells the bonds. Um, in the very first few tenders, they the, Ministry of Finance was a little bit reluctant to allow the yields go up, to go up to clear the market. And so the first few tenders weren't uh, to fully sell, if you like, to fully fund the deficit. But since then, uh, we've actually got to a position where the yields do clear the market. But again, we'll, we'll just see about that because the uh, Ministry of Finance and the Government will be remain a little bit sensitive to those rates. So there's a nice fiscal sweet spot right at this moment, but whether it'll last uh, in, in very good way that it is at the moment. Uh, we'll, we'll see. We'll probably see a little bit of retraction, a retraction on that. Uh, but the overall momentum and the direction uh, being very clear. 
Um, external trade and investment, the, the trade story, like the fiscal story, is an exceptionally good one. Uh, and one that, uh, as I mentioned, the economy more broadly, I think is a little understood because it's been a, a, a great success story, apart from some of the other stuff which has been highly problematic, I've mentioned and continue to mention. The trade story has been uh, a very good one. The current account deficit at the moment is about 2.6% of GDP, which is about half what it has been over the last uh, few years. What's driving it is very strong trade growth on both sides of the balance sheet. So we've got exports and imports up both very strongly. Um, as I mentioned earlier, in terms of the source of growth, it's very broad. It's not coming from any particular sector. But if one was to say what's different, what's the change, then the change is coming from the garment sector. So the traditional sources of export revenue for Lima are all there, whether it be gas, whether it be jade, of course, things like jade are both on and off book, um, or whether it be agricultural commodities, beans, pulses, rice, etc. That story more or less is exactly the same, but numbers are more or less up across the board. But the, the change over the last three or four years has been the garment sector. Now, that's a great story because it is suggesting, I mentioned earlier, that transformational growth has not taken place in Myanmar yet, and we're not seeing the story that we saw in Vietnam and places like that. But the beginnings of that story is potentially there in the government sector that's been growing in that recently. But that's highly vulnerable, which we'll look at uh, in a little while later. Okay, so it's a good story, a strong story when it comes to trade. Part of it is just this liberalisation story. So very central to the government's economic policy right from the word go was to try and free up areas of the economy. Um, that's been successful and unsuccessful depending on what part of the economy we're looking at. On the trade story, it's been pretty good, not perfect, but it hasn't been bad. You can see there we've just got some numbers for the number of export licences that you needed to have uh, before the government took office and then how it's reduced to now. Um, personally, I don't think you should have any export licenses. But anyway, getting down from nearly 8,000 down to just over 1,000 is not too bad, but uh, one would need more. Um, FDI, that's been the story. Foreign direct investment has been the story I mentioned earlier. A big source of disappointment in terms of investment from the West. Um, sometimes people ask me things like, you know, how is Myanmar going now that the investment from the West has fled? And of course, my answer to that is to say, well, it hasn't fled at all because it just didn't come, right? So it was expected to come, didn't arrive um, for all the reasons sort of I mentioned earlier. Um, so, but that is a problem because if one is talking about transformational growth and transformation of the economy, and again, if we looked at the, we look at the comparable story of countries in the region, that's where the transformation has come, uh, certainly in countries like Vietnam. So FDI from the West is almost non-existent. FDI from uh, Asia, however, is quite strong. Uh, and again, that government sector story that I mentioned earlier is overwhelmingly a story of investment from South Korea, from China, from Taiwan, uh, etc. Um, if we look at FDI last year, it's interesting because we're getting still some of the trails of FDI from years before. So the actual levels of foreign investment, the flows of funds, were up by 14%. But the approvals from which we might get uh, flows in the future are down by an equal amount. So it's not a catastrophic story. It's certainly not the story that's sometimes reported. But nonetheless, it's, it's a little bit disappointing. It's more than a little bit disappointing. It's disappointing compared to what, what we might have wanted at some point. Now, how to reverse it? What do you do about this? And, and we'll talk about this a little while later when we talk about the challenges in, in more detail. Um, but there are a number of specific things that the government do in addition or separate from the big political economy changes that will obviously be in the heart of all of this. Um, but amongst the reforms that have been put in place over the last year or so to try and uh, bring foreign investment is firstly uh, passing the new investment law, which brings together the domestic investment law and an international domestic law and tries to bring a level playing field on that front, but likewise to open things up uh, in quite a number of areas of the economy that offer things like tax incentives and other, other sorts of things. So the investment law was one. The company law, which has only just come out, only a few months ago in terms of being made active, 
uh, is likewise meant to stimulate foreign investment. The most important thing about this company law is that it allows investors to take up to 35% of an enterprise in Lima, and that enterprise still count as a local company. And what's important about that then, it means that the company still has complete access to land and some other things as well. But the land issue is really quite critical. Myanmar, like a lot of countries in the region, does not allow foreigners to own land. And that becomes problematic, not just in terms of buying land, but in terms of getting credit of which land might be collateral and so on. So it's a, it's a bit of an issue. So the fact that that has allows foreign ownership up to 35% is more significant than it sounds. Uh, but again, it's all part of just trying to attract foreign investment. Um, there's been a new ministry created, I mean, this is not in the area of economic reform as such, it's more just about the presentation of the country, but there's a new ministry that's been formed that's specifically about foreign investment, and uh, I know the minister of that ministry has been here and goes around the place uh, spruiking the email, basically. Lots of other new openings as well, things like retail sector, uh, wholesale trade, uh, education and so on is now being fully opened up to, uh, to foreign investment. Um, we'll look at the financial sector at the moment, there's been significant developments there in terms of foreign investment as well. Um, tourism I mentioned earlier, but just to underline the issue, what we've seen is a quite dramatic fall in tourism from the West. Uh, it's down about 30%. A little bit of a recovery, just the latest numbers came out about three days ago, Tiny bit of a recovery, but not much. And so it's down about 30% off its peak uh, back in, in 2016. Um, overall numbers that are up, it's interesting. So the number of tourists visiting Neva are actually at the highest level they've ever been in history. But in terms of revenues, they're not up. And because what we've got is basically the substitution for very high spending American, North American and European tourists with tourists from the region, but above all China. It is dramatic, the numbers uh, of, uh, of Chinese visitors in the country. Now, the downside though, the numbers are great, but the downside is that they, as I mentioned earlier, they spend nothing like the Westerners do. The Westerners tend to stay for about two weeks. They do a cruise down the Irrawaddy, they do visit the garden, they do the wind and, and uh, Inlay Lake and all that, where the Chinese tourists tend to come for just a few days, this is true for Vietnamese, tourists and some others as well, um, seem to come in on budget airlines, spend the time in and gone basically, with maybe a visit a day or two here and there, uh, but don't spend a lot of money essentially. There's this phenomenon which you've probably heard of called zero dollar tourism, where people buy a package in China, come to me and mother and actually spend zero as the, as the big buys in the country, because it's all sort of taken care of the package that's been bought at home. Uh, so there's all sorts of, uh, of you know, potential problems with this. Lots of discussion about it. It's a very hot topic. Uh, if you were to bring this up for a ta with a taxi driver, you would get <laughs> the taxi driver waxing lyrical about this particular issue. Um, yeah, not much really to say on that. It will require, I think, again, the broader political uh, issues in order to bring that around. Um, Exchange rate and inflation. One of the hottest topics last year was the exchange rate. Um, now, because of my background with the Reserve Bank and, and just more broadly, exchange rate issues are always very at the forefront of my mind. Not because they're important, because frankly, the exchange rate is ridiculously uh, over-discussed. I think no matter what country we're talking about, whether it be China, the US, or in this case, Myanmar. But anyway, it was a hot topic in Myanmar last year. The JAP was down about 16% across the year. This caused social media to go into meltdown. Um, that this, that Myanmar was, was collapsing, it was falling, uh, all the rest of it. Um, I weighed into this debate at some point and said, look, okay, uh, the jam is down, but it's, so is the Indonesian repair, so is the Indian repair, so is the Australian dollar. Being from Australia, it was nice to be able to point to the fact that the A dollar was tracking the jab against the US dollar almost exactly, one for one. Um, and I used the opportunity to point out that a flexible exchange rate can sometimes be a protector of the economy, as it has for Australia for the last 30 years. Whenever you get uh, softness with commodity prices, the exchange rate goes down, and it usually means then, given the commodities price in US dollars, that the $80 revenues stay roughly on track, no matter what prices are doing. 
Um, so for Australia, it's been a very good story. For Myanmar, it's not quite as good a story. It's a little bit of the Australian story, because Myanmar is a commodity producer. And so the fact the exchange rate can move up and down with commodity prices does protect domestic revenues for Myanmar producers. But Myanmar needs a lot of inputs, a lot of imports into the production process, and likewise with durable consumer goods as well. So there's a, a, a sting in the tail that's always there for Myanmar as the exchange rate goes down. And this caused, as I mentioned, a certain degree of hysteria. Um, the biggest reaction I ever, ever had to anything was when I tried to push back against some of the hysteria of the exchange rate. And it was that time that I was declared as, as being sort of conspirators to bring the country down and let George Soros take over and all these other sorts of things. Um, but anyway, uh, the exchange rate was down. It's, come back and it's appreciated at 2 or 3% in nominal terms since then. But in real terms, because Myanmar's inflation, which we'll look at in a moment, is higher than uh, the regional countries. And so in real terms, the exchange rate is up quite a bit. It's up about 7% or so, um, which is not good. Actually, you don't want that, because that actually means the country is less competitive. Anyway, so that, that's, that's it's firm a bit since. But it will be vulnerable. I have no doubt the exchange rate will move up and down. Uh, and of course, most of that movement will have absolutely nothing to do with the environment. But it'll be about uh, global trends. Uh, it'll be about uh, feelings of anxiety, etc., which tends to see a flood of investment to the US dollar, pushing the US dollar up, emerging country currencies down in the environment. Central Bank made a really good decision on this, in my view, which was to move the country on to a pure flow. So any effort to protect the chat was publicly disavowed. Now, this is also necessary. Myanmar doesn't have the foreign reserves to protect the chat anyway. Right? So the only way you can actually stop a currency falling in value is by intervening in the foreign exchange market, buy up the local currency with foreign reserves, and push the price up when, beyond where the market wants it to be. Well, Myanmar will last about a week with its foreign reserves and try to do that. Now, the other way you can fix an exchange rate, if you're not going to use market principles, is just to say it is illegal to trade the exchange rate at a rate other than the fixed rate. But Myanmar tried that for 50 years. And we have this ridiculous scenario, part of you know, Myanmar's long, glorious history when it comes to exchange rates, of having a fixed exchange rate of 6 jack to the US dollar and a market rate of 1,400 jack to the US dollar. And effectively then, Myanmar for 50, 60 years has had a pure flow anyway, but it was just called the black market rate for the chat. Now, the two have merged, and the currency essentially just flows. Um, you know, I mentioned there's been a reversal uh, since, uh, and, and at the time, actually, one of the reasons why I welcomed the drop was that it had reversed a real appreciation of being underway, uh, underway for now, that has had a negative impact on inflation, though, because as the jet has gone down, the prices of foreign goods have gone up. And I mentioned earlier, Myanmar is very highly reliant, both on the productive side and in terms of consumer durables, uh, from imports. So that has spiked inflation, and it's hit about 8%. Now, that should go down, because there's nothing that should sustain that. Because remember, inflation is a rate of growth, right? So we should see that taper off this year particularly because there's no money printing to speak of. So we should see that temper down. So I would make an inflation for this year. I'm more optimistic on, on this particular measure. That should go down probably about 5% this year and then start to taper off again, just depending on what the exchange rate does and so on. So that should be a temporary problem, but it is causing um, short-term anxieties in the country. So question about that. So a lot of the complaints last year about the economy came from that spike in inflation. Um, financial sector is my particular love when it comes to Myanmar, um, and it's been a story of very big reform in recent time, um, and very great control, and it's definitely a sector to have a look at. Now, I mentioned that you know, part of the government's overall strategy when it came into office was to try and liberalise the economy, try to open things up, make things more competitive. There was a political economy aspect to that. It was quite deliberate to dilute the power of what is often called in Myanmar the cronies, and other industries that are sort of basically stitched up by military enterprises and other players in the economy. So this was always part of the, uh, of the strategy. 
But central to this is the story of the financial sector. Because, of course, if you have access to capital, then you have access to markets. And so the financial sector in Myanmar traditionally has been completely stick sharp. Uh, there are about 20 odd private banks in Myanmar, plus four big state owned banks. But those private banks are all linked up to various of, again, of these older parties. The banks weren't truly banks, to be frank. They spent most of the time just lending to each other. Amongst the big 15 families that dominate Myanmar's economy, the banks just lend to each other. Their model was very, very simple. They lent real estate on real estate collateral and in the form of overdrafts. So if I wanted to do a loan in Myanmar, all I would have to do is take the deeds of the particular property belonging to a bank. The bank would give me half the value of the green value of the property in the form of an overdraft. And then at the end of the year, I would just roll the overdraft over. And I would keep on rolling it over until I built the building, sold all the apartments, and hopefully made a profit. But of course, if I didn't make a profit, and this gets us into the issue of a real estate bubble and so on, if I didn't make a profit, then someone is going to be on the hook, and that someone is almost certainly going to be a bank. And that's one of the things that we've seen. That model of lending on real estate collateral and little else, so it really wasn't a story in Myanmar of the banks lending to small business or, or entrepreneurs or anything like that. It really was just lending to real estate moguls uh, on property. That story has largely come to an end. And it means that the banks are in a little bit of trouble at the moment until they try and extricate themselves from this particular story. A lot of banks sitting on a lot of unsold collateral, in other words. Now, in order to try and fix this, the government brought in a new set of credential rules to try and turn the banks into real banks. They brought in credential measures relating to capital, which just says that the owners have to put in a certain amount, a certain percent, eight percent of the value of all the assets of the bank. The owner has to put in their money at risk, and it's one of the surest ways to, in, to keep the bank safe, is to make sure that the owner has value at risk. So, new requirements on that. New requirements on the liquidity that banks have, that is the cash that they carry so that they can meet the demands of customers if there is a panic. So you'll notice a lot of this is trying to shore the banks up. Right? Um, the next part, though, is starting to change the nature of the banking system. So the first two points are really about trying to make them safe. The second part is now about trying to reform the sector more fundamentally. Asset classification and provisioning. What we're getting at there is that if the banks are holding all these assets, which in fact are not performing, so if you've got a borrower, built a condominium, it's not finished, unsold, uh, they're not paying interest, or they're not paying principal on the loan, that's a non-performing loan, and it should be classified as such, and provisioned as such. If you get a $10 million loan and nobody's paying anything on it, then that should appear in the books as a non-performing loan, which is the production of capital and the bank has to provision against it. Traditionally in Myanmar, that was not done at all. Notwithstanding that it was in the law, going way back to 1990, but that was never done. So the central bank is beginning to enforce that now, and the banks are complaining bitterly this particular measure. There's nothing at all controversial about this. I mean, this is not central bank of Lima being really radical. This, in fact, is just standard banking practice. Um, and in fact, if anything, it's a, it's a softer, uh, kindly version of standard banking practice that you can see in most other places. So that, that's been the big one. Uh, the other part of it, apart from provisioning this asset classification, is to get the banks to move away from simple overdrafts on collateral. So what the banks are being asked to do is to convert their overdrafts into proper commercial loans. So fixed terms, which, uh, in which principal and interest are repaid, and so the, the, the loan is amortised in the language of banking and you gradually repay the debt across the period that it's meant to be repaid. So fundamental stuff to do with banking, nothing radical or anything like that, but Introducing it and trying to uh, trying to enforce it uh, is running into all sorts of controversy. Uh, likewise, everything I never mentioned, uh, but probably just stands out as being fairly obvious, and that is that there was an awful lot of connected lending where the banks lend to enterprises that affiliated to themselves. Again, most of the big private banks they sit in the heart of big conglomerates, and those conglomerates do all sorts of things of which banking is only a part. 
And so a lack of arms length, length banking has always been a big problem. And likewise, large exposure is just too much money to those uh, individual enterprises as well, which is always a problem. If you've got a lot of banks balance sheet lent to one single borrower, that borrower gets into trouble, then the bank's going to get into trouble. So there's been a huge push on reform. Uh, in the banking sector. And again, as I mentioned earlier, it is causing a lot of controversy. Um, the banks have basically said to the government, you're trying to kill us. Um, and uh, the government has replied by saying, well, you know, we're actually not. But uh, anyway, it is a very much a work in progress, this particular one. Um, notwithstanding all of that, the banks are still lending somewhat. So we saw in 2017, you see still 23.4% growth in lending which is one of those indicators that you always want to see if an economy is genuinely growing. It's one of those proxy measures, and it's also something that drives growth itself. Are resources going to the private sector? And there does seem to be a bit of that, notwithstanding you know, the issues that I mentioned. Continuing the financial sector, some of the really good stories, probably the best single story out of the EMAS financial sector is the mobile story. The mobile story has been an incredible one at every level. In the, uh, the best single policy by far of the Tanzanian government was to bring in Telenor and Aradu and open up the mobile story. It's absolutely extraordinary. In itself, it's a great story where something like 90, 93% of, of adult Myanmar citizens have a mobile phone and 90% of those are smartphones. Now, the great thing about that in turn is that that leaves the, the room open for other revolutions, but particularly in terms of financial services. And so one of the first things the government did when it got into office in April 2016 was to implement this thing called the Mobile Financial Services Directive, which basically just opened up Myanmar to the sort of story that we've seen in Africa, the famous m -Pesa story, where suddenly these phones became the way to save, to send money, to lend, to borrow, to do all sorts of things. And that story has really, uh, you know, again, been a really extraordinary one. Um, there's a couple of dominant companies. The one associated with, Wave, with uh, Telenor is called Wave Money, and it's a joint venture between the big Norwegian telco, uh, Telenor, and a local bank called Yoga Bank. Uh, and then Aradu, which is the other telco from, from Qatar, uh, likewise, it's got this mobile money scheme called m -Pisa, which is actually run by the people who delivered m -Pesa to Tanzania and Kenya and so on. Uh, and it has a relationship with another little local bank, so CD as well. And there's a couple of others that have made sense, but it's a great story. Growing, I think I've got there over 30% a, a month in terms of the number of transactions. It's a great story in terms of the agents, basically, all the little stalls you see throughout Myanmar, if they're selling the, the cards, the scratchy cards, etc., and the SIM cards, they're almost certainly going to be an agent for paying in and paying out. So the agent network, in fact, funnily enough, even though it's a tele, it, it's at one level it's a technology story, it's more a story of agent networks. These things are the facilitators, but the agents are the really key. Anyway, it's a really good story. The government has thrown its way behind it now as well. So all sorts of government payments are starting to be made through this system and likewise payments to the government through this system as well. So that's starting to sort of reinforce what was though very much a private sector story, even though it was allowed by that directive that I mentioned earlier. In terms of stimulating foreign investment, um, the foreign uh, banking story has been opened up a lot. So when the government took office, for instance, there were 13 foreign banks in the country, uh, and that had been only allowed since, since 2013. Um, but those banks were highly restricted. Essentially, they could only lend in foreign currency to foreign firms. That was about all that they could do. They could lend to local banks as well, but they were highly restricted in their mandate. That mandate is now being dramatically opened up. They can now lend in chat, and most importantly, they can now lend to Myanmar citizens and enterprises, uh, which is a great thing, actually, because it always seems to be just absurd that a country like Myanmar, desperately short of capital, had a situation where they allowed capital to be accessed by foreigners in their country and wouldn't allow capital to be accessed by local people in their country, ending the local currency. 
Um, so the great thing about foreign banks lending in local currency is that they have to be in foreign exchanges. So local borrowers just repay in jack, and if the jack falls in value against the US dollar, well, that's a problem for the foreign bank. It's not a problem for the local borrower. Um, so it's a really significant reform that one. Um, so their services have gone up. Likewise, um, the company law that I mentioned earlier will allow foreign banks to buy into local banks. There hasn't been any of that yet, but we'll see. But they can uh, now buy uh, into the local banks. The state-owned banking story was long the dominant story, but that hasn't been the case for a while, for about 10 years. But there remain four big state-owned banks, two of which are very big, the Myanmar terms, um, the Myanmar Economic Bank, the Myanmar Agricultural Development Bank. That's all being restructured at the moment. When it first came into office, one of the things the government did in order, I think, to make sure that they committed to reforming these banks was to took a $100 million loan off the World Bank to restructure them. That's now well underway. So the MEB, phase two of the reform of that is now underway. And the big Dutch bank, Rabobank, is the bank that's been commissioned to uh, reform the MEB and this agricultural bank as well. So that should be a good story, and that's going to be very much an alliance story right through. 2019. Microfinance has been growing exceedingly strongly and so far seems to be uh, doing well. Um, never going to transform anything, but in terms of just making financial lives that little bit better, keeping some people out of the hands of money lenders and so on, it's not a bad story. Insurance has been the big opening in terms of the financial sector over the last couple of months. So finally, after notwithstanding that it was agreed from day one that the government came into office that they were going to open up the foreign insurers and liberalise the sector. Well, that's happened now. Um, and so even, even as we speak, I think a week or so ago, the, the, uh, the bids closed for companies to foreign companies to come in and bid for a 100% foreign-owned life insurance uh, licence. Uh, in general insurance, they've got to come in as a joint venture. Uh, but life insurance, funnily enough, is where the foreign interest is anyway. Um, one of the reasons is simply that there is no life insurance effectively in Myanmar up until now, so it's always you know, a growth area. Life insurance probably, as you know, also requires all sorts of skills like actuarial skills that are frankly just not in Myanmar. So uh, it's going to be seen to dominate by foreign insurers. And in that way, it will replicate the story in Vietnam. It's exactly what happened in Vietnam where the big foreign life insurance companies, Prudential, AIA, MetLife, etc., and now not only dominate life insurance business, but because they build up domestic currency liabilities as people get older, the risks mount and the premiums mount, they have to match those against domestic currency assets, which insurance are government bonds. And so not only by opening the insurance sector do you get a sector of the economy that didn't exist before, You've got a cohort of investors with means and motive to fund the government through buying government bonds. And Myanmar needs to develop the bond market, needs to get away from money printing, as I mentioned earlier. So I actually used to say to the finance minister and to Dorsu itself that this is the closest thing I knew for free lunch in economics. <laughs> so please, let's eat it. Um, anyway, finally, that, that has now happened. So because of all these things, microfinance, the growth of the banks, the growth of the mobile sector, we see financial inclusion rates now that have dramatically caught up uh, to uh, countries in the region. Okay, so those are some sectors, some miscellaneous stuff. Sorry, but I hope I'm not rushing too much, but I want to um, make sure we've got plenty of time for questions and all that. Um, SOE reform, always a difficult one, of course, but that's very much on the agenda. That organisation, I'm a member of this NBI, Part of the thing that it's doing is going around looking at say an enterprise, trying to work out which ones are viable, which ones are not, which should be sold, which ones should be just closed down. Um, always controversial everywhere, of course, and the way that you do it, once you've decided to sell, say, or privatise, equally controversial. So we'll see work in progress. The electricity story, likewise, very much a work in progress. If we were in Yangon now, by now the lights would have gone off at least once. Um, but funnily enough, it's, it's a big story, this one, of both success and the otherwise. Um, success in the sense that there are now so many people drawing off the grid. So many more people are connected to the grid. 
electricity consumption is a really good proxy for economic growth. And so part of the electricity problem is that growth is exceeding the amount of electricity put on supply. Uh, but it's also a great inhibitor of growth, right? If you've got a country that can't generate the electricity that viable enterprise needs, then that's a problem. So electricity, it's a good story. There's been significant improvements in it, but way, way more improvement to go. So you look at that project bank that I mentioned earlier, those significant infrastructure projects, ranked according to socio-economic returns, right at the top of the big electricity projects. But I think everyone in this room will know that this is an area of great controversy as well, because this is where the hydro dams come in. This is where MIPSO and all that stuff fits into here. This is why there was temptation uh, to, to those ends. Um, which nicely brings me to the issue of Jiao Pu and the CMEC, the CMEC being the China Myanmar Economic Corridor. So amidst all the ups and downs in Myanmar, some serious, some less serious, but amidst, amidst all of them, the big transformation that's going on, the existential issue going on, is the relationship with China. So it, Got to a head last year over the uh, deep sea port in Jiao Pu. Um, that port, as originally conceived, was a dreadful deal for the It would have been at least as bad as the story in Sri Lanka for the Hang Tower Port, both in terms of financing and in terms of just the fundamental economics of the project. It would have been a disaster. Um, now, the good thing about that was that the government actually pushed back against it and renegotiated the whole Jiao Pu story with China, which agreed to essentially what the Myanmar government wanted. So a $10 billion project, which was way in excess of what Myanmar could usefully use the deep sea port there, was reshaped as a $1.3 billion project, and with various stages and various metrics that had to be met before it moved on to different uh, stages, and most pleasingly from my fiscal side of things, no Myanmar government guarantee at all. And so the Hamatoga story uh, won't be replicated at least when it comes to Jiao Pu. But Jiao Pu, of course, is one in a number of projects that are part of this China Myanmar Economic Corridor. And the China Myanmar Economic Corridor, in turn, of course, is part of BRI. And so there's a bunch of stuff there. Jiao Pu's in there in terms of the bag of, of infrastructure projects, the mid zone dam is in there. And we won't talk about that later, about where that might go. But there's stuff like that sitting in there. There's a rail line connecting Kunming all the way down to Jiao Pu, other rail lines going down to Yangon. And then there's the giant new Yangon City proposal. There is one other leg of the China Myanmar China, economic corridor, which is just to suggest that there is a huge story, a huge story going on between <coughs> Myanmar and China. It does involve massive investment, potentially massive debt, but an environment where, as I mentioned earlier, if Western investment is not there, and it's not, then we're in a situation where there's a real labor over this particular story. So th this one is just bubbling along, but we, we might talk about that in a moment, as half a week. Um, we're gonna see a bit more uh, by very, very soon, because in April, um, Aung San Suu Kyi goes to Beijing with all the other regional leaders to be part of the great big BRI uh, jamboree, the summit, central, where Xi Jinping will hopefully announce, um, from his point of view, a whole range of projects you know, proving the BRI. And so we'll see, no doubt, some, uh, uh, some conclusions to some of those BMI stories. In terms of political economy, um, I mentioned earlier that that liberalisation, opening things up, that's been the main thrust of political economy when it comes to what the government has been trying to do, successfully and unsuccessfully along the way, the financial sector thing I've mentioned. But there's other dimensions of it. If we look at defence expenditure, health expenditure, education expenditure and so on, we can see some rebalancing going on. Not enough, but we can see some of it, which again is just, I think, hopefully, suggesting where the priorities are. Okay, the big challenges, um, we all know them, right? They're, and they're, re they're real, they're existential in a sense, uh, and they've been the enormous disappointment over the last few years. So we know about the conflict, we know the conflict in Rakhine, 
Uh, the media was starting to cotton on that there was conflict in Kachin and so on as well, um, which has you know, been bubbling on for a, a long time earlier. But conflict is existential to Myanmar, as we know. It's been the thing that has caused uh, the, the political problems, in a sense, from day one, from the independence, was caused the coup in 62, uh, etc. Still unresolved. Human rights issues remain a significant problem in Myanmar. Now, in turn, that is triggering a reaction from the international community. Um, and that reaction is really starting to bite. And so we're in a situation right now where, if anything, the restrictions, the sanctions on Myanmar are now tighter than they ever have been compared to even back in the darkest days of the military. So if we look at what's ahead, um, the big one that everyone's waiting on is the European Union and what it's going to do with GSP. So GSP just stands for Generalised System of Preferences. It basically just allows the exports of poorer countries and in particular governments to enter the European Union uh, without any trade barriers. So there's a program called Everything But Arms. Um, now, if those GSP are withdrawn, you get different opinions about what's going to happen. And the worst case scenario is that that garment sector that I mentioned earlier has been the real growth sector when it comes to the real different sector when it comes to FDI, could be decimated. Now, the social impact on that in turn would be huge. That if that scenario plays out according to some of the, the estimates, we could see half a million people thrown out of work. Uh, and those people are mostly rural women who, of course, have nothing to do with the atrocities taking place in Rakhine or Kachir or anywhere else for that matter. So that one everyone's waiting. There was a, a delegation from the EU that was out about five months ago. They've just been out in the last couple of weeks. The meetings with those people went extraordinarily well. And most of those people from the EU actually saw that, that uh, the levying of sanctions like that would be counterproductive. But as they counseled on their way out, this will always be a story in Brussels politics. And whatever those, uh, that delegation recommended is probably not going to be the deciding factor. So we wait to see. Um, one of the other really serious things that's happened in recent times is that the State Department has declared that Myanmar is a T3 country when it comes to human trafficking, which basically just means that the government is not doing enough to eliminate the danger of human trafficking. That in turn sets off a series of requirements from the United States. Um, in the past, those weren't triggered because a general waiver was given to countries like Myanmar and a few of the others actually that were designated as T3. Under the Trump administration, there's a general rule not to give waivers, but there's also, we think, a specific finding with respect to Myanmar not to give the waiver. Now, what this triggers, which has been held in abundance before, is basically what happens in terms of assistance. So if you're a T3 country and there's no waiver, the US must use its vote against any assistance provided by the World Bank, the IMF, or the ADP. That's one, so that would cut that off effectively. Even though the US vote's only about 18%, but it would take a lot in practice, actually, to, to overturn that. So that's significant, because those, those organizations are somewhat useful, although we might get on to that, just how useful they are a little later. More importantly, I suppose, for the US is that also uh, aid, US aid assistance, could not be given to the government. It would have to be given by other agencies. So even as we speak, the US aid people in, in, uh, in Yangon and Desmond are trying to work out where they might stand on that. So all of that's ahead, which is problematic. Um, and again, probably in the end requires some sort of broader political settlement in the country before any of that uh, gets to, to where it needs to be. Other stuff that's going on, um, the country remains, or the economy remains, structurally very similar to, as it has done for such a long time. There, the, all the efforts that, that the reformers up there in Napier are trying to do is to end all this stuff by just chipping away at the old Dirigi sort of economy, but nonetheless, it's still there. So if one was to characterize it, it's an economy that remains crony dominated, um, if one was to look at the bureaucracy, the government, the NLD may have come into office at the top, 
and have some of their own ministers, not all, there's only a third of the ministers are NLP anyway, but you then get into the bureaucracy, the decision-making bodies. They've grown up 50, 60 years under a very hierarchical, rigid system that has its roots in the military, but of course has its roots also in other traditions as well. There's great deference to age in Myanmar, which many people will have noted from before, and it just means that it's so damn hard to get any change through the bureaucracy. And this is not people necessarily blocking reforms, it's often just inertia. They're just trying to get things done. Probably the most shocking thing I've encountered um, beyond intellectually, you, you go to maybe you're expecting things to be difficult, but, um, but emotionally confronting those ministries and those bureaucracies with the piles of paper, all literally tied in red tape, <laughs> it's really something to behold. Uh, but anyway, um, but th this whole command and control sort of thing remains very much there and very, very difficult. Um, then there's reform resistance that's more over. Right? So there is active reform resistance as well. Some of it from enterprises and individuals that like the current arrangements. Some of it's political, with the elections coming up next year. I think we'll see a lot more of that. But that's a factor there as well. But I would probably put just a version of someone behind that. Right? Final thing when it comes to big challenges is just international volatility. Um, Myanmar's not in a good position for a volatile world. It's an emerging market with lots of needs from other countries. It needs, in other words, a world that has a fairly high risk appetite. And unfortunately, the world is moving anything but uh, you know, towards a, a great risk appetite. So the, the time ahead is going to be really tough, I think, no matter how things go. Domestically, the international environment is just not really uh, set up to, to serve Myanmar's interests. Okay, so I think that that's all I've got in terms of the slides. Um, probably what I'll, because we've got, oh yeah, so it's up to six, so we should have 20, 25. Yeah, so, so I might just stop formally talking there and just take questions, because uh, I would like to touch upon some of the other things to do with some of the players that are sort of trying to divide the pie up, but we'll, we'll do that. Great, thank you very much. <laughs> would anybody like to start? Yes. from the ministry itself, 
is actually coming from the Chinese state and enterprise that wants to access the funding and the work and the royalties and all that sort of stuff uh, from by tying up with the export import bank or the Chinese development bank, etc. So sometimes the project selection itself can be a problem. Even if that's not the case, though, sometimes you find that the financing is a problem. So, for instance, one of the things that I've seen is that um, sometimes loans are presented to the VMR department as being interest-free, but then you find actually that the tendering and the uh, of of the wherever the work is, etc., is completely opaque. So you have, in other words, no idea what the real cost of what it is. So say it's to build a railway line. Because there's no competitive or open tendering, you don't know how much it really costs. And so an interest rate can be implicitly built in to the price of the particular infrastructure. So, um, so sometimes I've seen me and my government departments get very excited about an interest-free loan and they come to the Ministry of Finance and say, look, we can get this interest-free loan from China, let's do this. But then the part of the, the brief of Ministry of Finance is trying to work out, well, hang on, if it's really interest-free, let's see if we can do some analysis for how much this project will cost. So that's one aspect. Another thing that we've noticed is that very often the loans are given in kind, so that the, the um, what happens is the stock, the railway carriages, the tracks, the, the sleepers, all that, come into the EMR. So there's no funds, even though you're borrowing from the export import bank, no funds actually ever do come into the EMR, just the, the goods in kind. But repayment is often in a foreign currency, and usually what's specified is US dollars. Now, that poses real problems for a country like Myanmar because if you're a railway, let's say it's a domestic railway, you're not earning any US dollars. So those US dollars have got to come from somewhere else in the economy. So you're adding to the stock of Myanmar's foreign debt without adding to the ability of your country to earn foreign earnings, to repay that foreign debt. So those are a couple of sort of little technical things that, that have been problematic um, and, and replicated uh, around, the, around the place. But if you can get those right, though, if you can actually make sure that the project is something you want, and it's not a state-owned enterprise, just sort of chancing it's hard, and you can make sure that the financing is done properly, and it's open and all that, and that GRP story is an example of how to do it, then, in that case, then all of the infrastructure would be really good. On to Mitsou Dam, it's interesting because um, the whole China Myanmar Economic Corridor um, has a number of items in it, including Mitsou Dam. And the Mitsou Dam, as everyone here knows, has been enormously controversial. The suspension of that dam, dam was the real first sign that the Tansai government was something real, something different to pass the Myanmar government, so people really took up uh, took notice of it. And of course, it's a real flashpoint when it comes to the various ethnic nationalities. But, particularly the Kachin. So it's a really big issue. It's hung around. So it was an old deal signed by the military even before Tan Sein's government. The deal was really badly done, like really badly done. So how much Myanmar is on the hook for if it cancels the dam is a subject to much debate. The state-owned enterprise behind it, so the Chinese state enterprise is claiming that Myanmar doesn't go ahead, Myanmar has to pay compensation of 800 million US. Which is a massive amount by by Myanmar standards. Now, lawyers that I've spoken to have said, well, they could ask for it. <laughs> they can't remember it. But anyway, it would be a sizable amount of money. So it's sat there as a real problem. It's up until now it's been a problem that nobody really wants to talk about, right? They just want it just to see the fester in the background and not really do anything. On the China side, um, it's interesting because as originally conceived, its zone was going to generate a lot of electricity, but this 90% work was to go to Yunnan, right, and not, and not to Myanmar. And that was a part of the controversy that Myanmar had no electricity. What the hell was it doing selling electricity to Yunnan? Since then, however, since the dam was first proposed, Yunnan's got plenty of electricity. It doesn't need the electricity. So it's really interesting that the project has now been reconfigured by the state-owned enterprise behind it as being the part of the solution to Myanmar's electricity problems. So now the proposal is that electricity be turned around, well, I don't really have the language for this one, <laughs> turn the electricity around, pump it into, transmit it through the Myanmar grid, which would also then be reinvigorated by the same state-owned company, which now has speak behind the big state power and investment corporation, it's called 
something like that. So, um, so it's a huge project now, potentially, and being presented as the solution to the Mars electricity store. But, so that's okay, but we've still got the real problem of the dam and, and what would happen to the hundreds of thousands of people, potentially, who would be relocated. And the real problem, the political problem of where it is, um, the damage it will do to the Illawarri, the, the absolute, I think, um, breach of trust, if you like, between the government and, and the Kachin and, and a lot of other ethnic nationalities, this would be symbolically I think, terribly problematic for the government to allow this dam to go ahead. So that, that's what a war was, but it sort of suited everyone and just be quiet about it. It suited China to dangle it, because maybe it wanted Xiao Piu, maybe it wanted something else, and you could just dangle it. Um, but then it got to a head about a month ago, right, or six weeks ago or something. And it came to your head because, well, for a number of reasons, but the, the trigger, I suspect this would happen anyway, but the specific trigger was the, um, the uh, American and the British ambassadors went to see Kachin people. And the Chinese ambassador got really upset about this. And he went on a tour up to Kachin State and basically said, um, look, the Americans and the Brits are, in, uh, are interfering in Myanmar's affairs. Um, this is inappropriate. He actually even said interfering in our national affairs, which I thought was interesting, to his words. Um, and, uh, but then also said that the discussion they had was that local people actually wanted the dam. And he also said that Dorsu, the Hong San Suu Kyi, had, was now had changed their mind about the dam, and that it might go ahead. This caused huge fuss. Now, the, the view in Nampior and Yangon, in official circles, is somewhat confused about all of this. Um, to the best of my, my knowledge, there is no change to policy when it comes to the exam. And so there's been no authorization, no desire for it to go ahead or anything like that. It remains suspended on the back burner, and I can see no evidence, have seen nothing at all to suggest that that's, that's not, not the case. Um, given all of that, there's a bit of a view around that Maybe this was just what you would call flying a kite. Um, to see what the reaction was of local people, the politics, the politics of the government, etc. Um, but Midtown certainly remains in the, in the mix and unclear at the moment where it's going to go. Personally, I find it inconceivable that it would happen. But, you know, strange things would <laughs> happen. Yes, <coughs> thank you for the uh, very interesting insights. Uh, on the point about the domination and the form of systems, um, can, you, can you actually update us on the uh, development and the, on the two military-related companies, the NBC and the Myanmar operations? At one stage, I was hearing that one of them is going to be a very public. Um, I don't know what has happened since. Yeah. And also, you know, how, what do you see about the future of these two companies in terms of the combinations? So, the first thing to say about them is that their, their influence is much less than it used to be. Because for a while there, of course, all the private concessions went their way. And so, with the opening up and, and the growth of other cronies, in fact, their influence sort of dropped off quite considerably. Um, so, that, that, that's the first thing to say. Um, having said that, though, they remain still highly lucrative. As, as cash cows for, for both the serving and, and the Thai military, uh, and uh, are able to do things that other companies just can't, basically. So, so they, they remain significant, again, in terms of this broader political economy. Um, a, as you mentioned, one of them did float the idea of floating on the, uh, the Mishmaster market, and I think we drew from that on the basis of two things. One is that that would mean that they would have to be much more transparent about the things that they would otherwise. But I think even more to the point, they actually looked at the performance of companies that floated on the Econ Stock Exchange and thought, well, maybe we won't do this. Um, I think that probably was more, more to the point. Um, so yeah, personally, I, I see them gradually diluting in terms of their overall impact on the economy, but they'll, they'll hold on to some very lucrative revenue streams all the way through. And it's hard to imagine 
that they'll disappear. In fact, I'm sure they won't. If one was to look around the region, we could see similar military aid companies assisting, um, whether it be in Thailand or Indonesia or wherever. So I'm sure that will be a hand for that matter. Um, I'm sure they won't go away. Um, but the hope has always been that as the economy becomes more private sector oriented, more competitive, and all that, that their influence would, would gradually dilute. So that, that remains the plan. Thanks very much, Sean, for this fascinating talk. Um, I know you have an economic focus, but you did mention some sort of discussions about a national political settlement, and I'm assuming you're also talking about the situation where Kanye and the Rohingya issue and all these kinds of things. Um, I wonder if you could comment on, on what kind of possibilities, I realize it's perhaps difficult to speculate, but possibilities you see of that occurring and an additional question is, you know, given the fact that the foreign press has missed this whole success story in the Myanmar economy, I'm wondering really how strong the pressures are. I mean, you showed that the disadvantages will drop off in, in Western investment interests, um, the, the sanctions uh, that are stricter or stricter than before, it looks like. But nonetheless, the economy seems to be growing. It has a broad base. So, you know, is there really that much pressure to you know, to, to deal with issues that besides considerations for human rights within Myanmar itself would also have these implications economically. Yeah, um, on, on the first one, like I, 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 I actually don't know. I, I really don't know. Um, you know, uh, it, it's not only above my brain, brain but sort of outside it as well. Um, so, um, you know, I. I, I see a number of actors out there in Napier who, who are genuinely trying to do stuff, um, but exactly where where they're up to um, is not, you know, I'm not, I'm not really privy to. Um, uh, part of it just comes from that um, that broader aspect. That I, I sort of touch upon just a little bit in talking about the bureaucracy, but this probably is an opportunity to talk about just broadly how. The, the scope of allowable activity by the civilian government is quite small, and it's much smaller than I think, again, is properly understood outside. Um, the parameters of, of move, movement, I think, are very small on, on a lot of these things. The red lines, if you like, that are sometimes explicit, uh, whether it be in the Constitution, or sometimes just implicit, um, are nonetheless really there. And so very often with all these things, it's a matter of sort of edging towards them as opposed to sort of confronting them directly although again my expectation is that we will see a bit more of that um, in, in the time ahead um, but yeah it's the, those sorts of issues i suppose well just to be frank <laughs> with the economic reform team and, and i should mention too by the way that in looking at these economic the MSDP, the Project Bank, the financial sector stuff, the liberalisations and all that. This is all being delivered by a team of people that numbers about five. <laughs> so uh, it's a tiny, tiny, tiny cohort. And it's the same people. So the people who renegotiated the Jiao Pu are the same people who are behind those banking sector reforms, who wrote the financial services directive, who wrote the Project Bank, who wrote the MSDP, get sometimes pulled into, uh, well, well, are being pulled into the China Myanmar Economic Corridor and all that, which the, the reason why I mention that is just to, again, to highlight just not only um, is the, the broader political dimension just so much more fragile, um, so much less under the control of the civilian government than it might appear, but it even extends into the areas like economics as well. It's a, it's, it's a really, um, what to say, not, not fraught, but it's, um, it's even impacted just by really, one of the biggest practical constraints against the pace of economic reform is that someone who needs to do this is doing that <laughs> on that particular day. Um, and um, so, and, and I think it's the same with the other stuff as well, actually, I mean, even, even to the broader politics and so on. Um, one of the 
one of the things I've observed is that um, it's hard to sustain things when you're constantly needing to change topic. Um, so a new crisis comes along and things have to stop in a certain area and then you go on to the next one, and then another crisis happens, you go on to the next one, and then finally you might come back to the original thing. And in the meantime, it sort of festered or got worse, etc., along the way. Um, so, um, yeah, so I, I haven't very adequately answered your, your question, mainly because of my ignorance, that's number one, because I, I genuinely am not, not involved in some of that stuff. Um, but, but I would venture that, that the same sorts of, sort of problems on the economic side of the year, but also it's much more fraught um, and, uh, and it's sort of much more directly confronting the old sort of forces. I think we have time for one, unfortunately, just one more question. Uh, uh, well, I was very impressed with the presentation. It was a, it was a great overview of the, of the current uh, situation. Uh, my question concerns, um, uh, I will start from kind of more specific, um, uh, the position of uh, the Myanmar Central Bank. Uh, you mentioned that uh, your, the, the, you know, the government will still rely on, on, on some printing of money. So I assume that there is no independence of the of the of the bank uh, uh, as such. And so my question is, what is the position of the bank? Uh, is there any law in pipeline which would ensure its independence? And um, is there any other kind of preparation, not only law about the central bank, but any other issues? or potential situation which may arise in uh, two years uh, after the next election, which NLD may win, but may not be able to form the government because it will not have the super majority to do it. So um, essentially, it might be a new government, and uh, a lot of those reform initiatives, without being solidified, may be kind of uh, put back to uh, kind of a, where we don't want them to be. So, uh, how is your you know, view of this uh, this issue from the kind of concrete to kind of general? It's a great point, eh? and, and I think the general point is actually the, the, the $64 the question in the sense, right? Because as we know, ruling Myanmar remains personal as opposed to institutional. So, the institutions are not there yet. And so, if and when the government changes, then I would imagine that the character of that government will then reflect you know, whoever it is that comes into power. Um, so that, that, that's sort of just a broad observation, but then into the specifics. On the central bank, it's an interesting story. Right? Firstly, it is independent, legally. <laughs> so in 2013, a central bank independence law was brought in, um, and it uh, was drawn up by the, the IMF, and it is a rigid independence law. Um, so uh, there are all sorts of strictures against the, the, the government in uh, acting on the, on the um, and in fact, funnily enough, that is how it's largely turned out in practice at the moment. Um, for good and ill, um, there's, you, you know that famous old quote about St. Augustine, about, you know, give me chastity, but just not yet. Um, it's a little bit like that with the central bank, frankly, is the central bank independence. We, okay, we actually could have done with, with that a little later, not, not, not right now. Um, so there are some issues at the central bank. The central bank, I think, is one of those institutions, like the bureaucracy more broadly, that is very, very old-fashioned, um, very hard to move. And so some of the biggest struggles that we've had in driving some of the financial sector reform, I, I never mentioned, for instance, that one of the good reforms was a degree of liberalisation of interest rates, uh, because this is really holding the country back, because if you don't have interest rates, uh, liberalise them, and then essentially loans will only go to, to grains, basically, if you can't price the risk, which the banks come at the moment. Um, the central bank is, is very against that, and so um, you know, we, we have all sorts of problems to do with its innate conservatism, I think. Um, so it is sort of independent. Um, perhaps, um, perhaps later on we can talk about some particular examples of my view on that problem. I've never got Bumbling about too much about that, but um, but yeah, um, but your broad point I think is, is absolutely right. We we see it all over the place that um, 
the institutions, whether they're good or bad, depending on the people, and uh, rather than the, the institution themselves. And so, um, one, one of my main criticisms of the previous government, the Tanzanian, the Tanzanian government, and, and the risk of getting, using a horrible, horrible academic expression, uh, but there's an academic expression called isomorphic mimicry, which basically just means that you look around the world and what looks good in terms of reform, you just adopt. And so I would say the Central Bank Independence is a classic example. So in 2013, we looked around and said, okay, rich countries have independent central bank, let's have an independent central bank. And boom, you get it. Regardless of whether it's appropriate, whether the law actually delivers that, or the circumstances allow it to take place, or, or whatever. And we see lots and lots of examples of that. And I think that, that legacy and continuation as well has caused a lot of isomorphic there's a lot of institutions, laws around that say that they do certain things, but in reality they don't, and that makes them really vulnerable, again, because it's personalised. And so, yeah, people, if good people are there, it's fine, but if it's not, then it's a demoral thing. So, um, yeah, but that's the sort of transformation that hasn't taken place. Thanks so much, Sean. Thanks.